child abuse and abuse of women in families, abuse of men of course too, but especially child sexual abuse, we would, we would be obliterating, you know, 50 to 75 percent of all mental illness, if you're going to call it that. Stopping that kind of stuff will stop people like me ending up with bodies being buggered by it the medications we're forced to take. I don't want carers to be in that position and I know what it's like to be a carer too. And I lost one of, I inherited four girls um, when my girlfriend died. Um, so I've got six daughters um, and one poor husband. And um, <laughs> I lost one of my girls um, 18 months ago. So I know what that pain is like and I know that carers want their children, their partners, whatever, to be as well in whatever way they can. They get so desperate. And I understand that desperation. But the thing is, we need to be able to help people to get treatment and support in the community before they, or the people who care about them and love them, become desperate. We need to be getting to the point where no one's desperate. And then the staff and the doctors and the nurses and the um, support people won't burn out because they won't be feeling desperate either. And they'll be seeing that what they do on a daily basis is making a positive difference in people's lives. And that's a win, 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 win situation. Because mental health is intergenerational, it's whole of government and it's whole of life. We need to be treating and supporting people in a holistic way, including their family. So thank you for having me. So um, I'm here to talk about the Partners in Recovery program and you've already heard snippets of it today from Caroline and Faye. The aim of it is to improve the response of the service system to people who do live with enduring and persistent mental illness and do have multifaceted support needs. It's a program that can be tailored locally. So in our region we have six services that provide supports to people who experience mental illness, um, created the model and they govern the model ongoing. It's also delivered in partnerships. So Central and Eastern Sydney PHN, which was formerly Medicare Locals, um, are the lead for the program in the region. And it's delivered by the Benevolent Society, Nimai National, yay, Aftercare, Advanced Diversity Services, which is formerly St George Margaret Resource Centre, and Caranel Aboriginal Corporation, who has joined the program this year, which is really exciting. So when a person um, comes into the program, they're working with a support facilitator, we go through a range of assessments. What it really is, is a very um, targeted conversation about what is important to a person, what do you value in your life, are you moving towards that, or, or are you a bit stuck, are you moving away from that? And we really uh, work with the person to build a bit of a vision of where they want to go, and then we start to bring in the things that people will need to help them get there. So as you can see, these are all PIR people in the room. Come and talk to us about how um, we can better support you in the work that you do. These guys are amazing. If you have a question, they will fight, like a true no wrong door approach. If you're not eligible for the program, they will find a service for you in the community and it won't just be, here's a phone number, give them a call. They will ring. A big round of applause for them, please.
for a lot of our methamphetamine users as a result of a lot of the alienation that they feel in terms of the messages that are going out, coupled with they're perhaps not being in that space where they um, are concerned about their use. Frequently, we're really not seeing methamphetamine users, unfortunately, until they're right down that pointy end and may well have had a hospital admission in relation to some psychotic or psychosis type ep um, episode. There's such a limit on funding and services available that clients, people are falling through the cracks. They're not getting the supports they need. And that's when we go from that minimal intervention cost to the larger intervention cost as well. So what we need to do is have that awareness of what people's roles, what their responsibilities, what their capacity is within their service. And you would be surprised when a group of service providers gets together and communicates. So the whole multidisciplinary approach, what can you do within your role? Okay, What can you do within your role? And get together, you'd be surprised as to how much you can actually do for that individual to support them. OCD is a bit of a, a success story in the sense that there's been a revolution since the 1960s. Before the 1960s, OCD was considered one of those lost causes. Um, people with OCD was considered, who were considered untreatable. There's nothing we can really do with this. We've tried talk therapy where we try and get at the root cause of why people are washing or why people are checking so excessively. We can't get at it. It's a hopeless condition. Might have to institutionalize people. There's nothing that can be done. And luckily, we're in a very different place nowadays where there is treatment available that's quite effective, although can be challenging um, to administer. And the two most supported by the plethora of studies out there are exposure and response prevention and cognitive therapy. There's conflicting research about the impact of imprisonment for people with mental illness. There's some that sort of says, look, people actually often are medicated for the first time. They're, they're sleeping, they're kind of, they're taking less drugs and so mental illness tends to stabilise. But then there's also sort of the experience of many people like Brad where they, you know, are feeling absolutely dreadful but find asking for support incredibly hard because of the punitive nature of the environment. So when people come out of prison, often, um, their experience in terms of asking for help or being honest about what's going on with them and being vulnerable about what's going on with them has been incredibly uh, compromised by that experience of institutionalisation. My name is Richard and I work for the Bobby Goldsmith Foundation. I discovered today that um, a lot of people that have been in the prisons recently have been going back there constantly and the main reason is because they suffered mental illness and no one has been able to look at that part of their life. My name is Catherine Airy. I'm a GP. Well, I really enjoy Faye's speech at the beginning, the keynote speaker. Faye spoke about, she spoke from her experience and she's talking about um, treating people as people. And it's really good to hear that. And it's really good to hear the language being modelled that actually reinforces that. Many of our clients are basically dealing with the difficulties associated with alcohol, with um, um, illegal illicit drugs, uh, and they try to self-medicate themselves. The person usually wakes up because of fear and then the person cannot go sleep again. Person who doesn't sleep for a long period of the time really needs to see the psychiatrist, needs to be medicated. Look, as a clinical psych, I'm more on a side of a psychotherapy and uh, using and exhausting psychotherapy as much as we could. I'm not the person who would say, go and medicate yourself with the doctor. But this is a case and this is a situation when we usually need to suggest medication. Working with eating disorders specifically and then coming into this broader role of service development with, um, with SED and in southeastern Sydney, there seems to be a pervasive kind of view with clinicians and services that I meet with that there's something different about people with eating disorders and there's something special or unique or outside our skill set and although I'm going to again highlight some of those differences today I think there's also a real importance to emphasize how they overlap with other really serious and complex mental illnesses that we see and I've had a great day sitting in the ice presentation and the OCD presentation and so many things that were brought up there I could have just replaced the word eating disorder with what was being said. 
My name is Dimitrios and I'm a support facilitator for Advanced Diversity Services, former St. George Migrant Resource Center. I really like the conference. I think uh, it's uh, lots of uh, information shared, the best practices, and uh, also it's an emotional journey because many real life stories are being shared. And I think this is great. Uh, my name's Samantha. I am one of the coordinators for the Hoarding and Squalor program, over 65. So I think today was really good because one, networking. It's great to see all the other providers out there and how we can help each other because I think that's one of um, the main points is learning to collaborate with one another, so knowing who's out there. Although psychology helped me in that I was able to finally voice my feelings and come to terms with the fact that I was suffering from a form of post-traumatic stress from the violent marriage. Ultimately, I was unable to relate to the white psychology. The drugs I was prescribed didn't help and my drinking only exacerbated the intensely blue feelings I had. I knew I had to find a way back. I knew I had to find my mojo. The alternative was too devastating to contemplate. Then I had to start dealing with my feelings at the loss of my mobility and having to come to terms with being in a wheelchair. And I also had to find new ways of making a living and of living in general. And I decided to become a writer. People um, with disabilities should really be encouraged to connect with social media and be uh, taught how to use it um, to its utmost advantage because I think, um, in a way, um, it saved my life.